The market has been created by yes. men. It's not a crime to be a 44-year-old white male either. Rob Moore, multi-millionaire, property developer, host of Disruptors podcast and money expert. His mission is to help you overcome your limiting beliefs about money. There are about 25 million men that would say Andrew Tate is good for society. And that terrifies me. Is it not good? for people who want there to be less of a gender pay gap that someone like Andrew Tate is chirping yeah, It's in. good, but not when you're denying its existence. But you're always going to have two sides of an argument, aren't you? Well, and surely you want people wading in. Him wading in, whether you agree or not, all of a sudden, 20 million people are discussing it. What do you think about feminism? Ooh. Why are you obsessed with money? Most people do not know anything about money. I'm not going around judging anyone who's broken happy. What I'm trying to do is educate people who are broken unhappy. I'm here opening my soul on the anatomy of a leader saying, bring it. In this episode of Anatomy of a Leader, I grill Rob Moore. Well, he did ask for it. He gets very heated. Even the camera stops working when we discuss Andrew Tate. Spot the moment when the camera stops working. Write down the exact time in the comments below or leave a review on Apple Podcast. Follow and subscribe to the show and I will pick a winner and send you a copy of Rob Moore's book, Money. Oh, and at the end, he hands me some cash. So stick around to find out how much I take from him. Rob. Yeah. Welcome to Anatomy Hello. of a Leader. So good to have you on the show. <laughs> Take four. Take four. Yeah. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me into your home. It's lovely. Thank it's you. got character and history and it's lived in. Is that just a nice way of saying it's messy? No. So what makes it lived in? Character. The sunglasses have got their own place. The shoes have got their own place. The toys have got their own place, though. They've got a little bit of a mind of their own. Yes. And, and maybe 20 minutes before we turned up, it was all shoved in there. Very observant of you. Mm. Thanks for inviting me here. No, my pleasure. Because you are the property entrepreneur, I guess all of these small details are like very telling to you. So you pay attention more to that. Would you say that? Um, well, when it comes to property... That really was my business, mm. and that was how I made my, I guess, what you could say, my fortunes or my empire. So this is a home, not an investment property. Mm. But um, I love going into other people's homes. I don't do it much because I'm not particularly social, and I'm not just going to knock on people's doors. But, you know, most um, podcast interviews I've done, I don't go to their homes. I actually think it's fascinating that um, you've got your studio here. Mm. I mean, what if you had a really awkward, weird interview with someone mm. and they're in your home. Well, I did think about that because when Harry messaged and said, oh, you know, we can't... Rob I'm, might be a weirdo. I've never seen him. He's not on social hey, media. What? Me? No, him. I'm all over the place. No, you are. <laughs> yeah. But how would I know that he's associated with you, right? Yeah. So sending my address did feel a little bit... Yeah, like, don't worry, we won't save it in sat-nav. Okay. We won't put it on a story on Instagram. Like, is it really you turning up today? <laughs> yeah. I wasn't completely sure, you know. But, um, no, well, thank you so much for saying that about my home. I mean, mm. we've lived here for like 30 years, yeah. so it's definitely lived in. Having to deal with deciding what you do with your property, because you can get so attached. Do you have that? Yeah. Or do you get attached to no. anything? No. No. I get attached to the money. Because if I want to live in it, I get attached to it. I love, you know, I want a beautiful art. I want the house laid out just how I want. You know, I want a zen, tranquil space to work and to be. This is why, you know, when people say, oh, you should rent and not buy. I don't agree with that because, you know, this is a nice, zen, tranquil space where you can both work mm -hmm. and you can bring people and do a podcast in. Wouldn't, have, wouldn't be the same if it was a rental. So, no, my house, I want to make a home. But when it comes to making money, what you want to make a home probably won't make money. What you want to make money on is something different. So I'll buy dilapidated stuff and do them up, or I'll buy commercial and convert. So if this was in, let's say this was in the town centre in Peterborough, but there was a shop on the, fr on the bottom floor, I'd buy it. I'd probably either sell or rent the shop, and then I'd convert flats, which obviously you see all around here in London. Um, because it's a business. It's not, you know, if you run a business with your heart, it's very hard to make it commercially viable for the long term. You can put heart into a business, but if you let your heart rule rather than your head, I, I don't think that's a good recipe. Hmm. Talking about money, so... Like, My favourite like, subject. It is your favourite subject, and I'm going to get to that. So when you were, when it was the whole clubhouse rage, I remember logging on, I was pretty much like, 
devoting my life to it, but mm. not as much as you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, so you weren't every as sad time, as me, is what you're saying. Every time I go like, there you were. And I have to say that at that point, that's probably when I've learned about you. And I have made like massive assumptions about you. Go on then, tell me them. I'm I will fascinated. Get to that. I will, I'll, I'll, I Dish the dirt. Wa- I think I need to warm up a little bit. Ah. To, um, don't, don't wriggle out of that one. I won't. Uh, do you know I one of the things? Get to know you a little bit. No, no, no. I, can share. I really like it when people make assumptions about me and then mm. meet me, yeah. because actually, I try not to do that, um, because I think you don't know someone until you get to know someone. I think you try not to do that, but I think it's very hard not to. Because so, we, come on, then. What are these assumptions? I'm going to get to them, but not now. Like, <laughs> I want but to you're going to forget. You're going to forget. <laughs> no, I won't. But when I learned that you've written 18 books, 19 now. 19 books. 20th, I was very intrigued. I'm being I'm writing my 20th as we Amazing. speak. Amazing. Yeah. So it's like somebody who takes the time and effort to write books, which are mostly for the purpose of sharing knowledge or imparting for helping something. people helping improve people. their lives. Yeah. I'm like, okay, that's, that's interesting. And I, I get about like not making judgments and I try to do the same, but I think it's impossible as a human being not to have some kind of bias or thought or Especially opinion. someone who has anxiety as a trigger that could trigger some judgments couldn't it that's interesting Mm. that's very interesting and Mm. that probably plays into that Mm. um and you talk about the book that you have written that's your favorite book which is money so why are you obsessed with money this episode is sponsored by hvo search a specialist executive search and talent advisory firm helping founders ceos and hr directors hire the most in-demand and best c-suite talent Tired of seeing the same old CVs and uninspiring candidates? Reach out to me, Maria Vorostovsky, to find out how your business can skyrocket with the best talent. So why are you obsessed with money? Right, this is my favourite subject. Here's why I'm obsessed. Well, I'm actually not obsessed with money. That's a, a fallacy. I was more obsessed with money when I didn't have any. I don't know if you've ever been broke, I have. But when you're broke and you can't even afford food and you can't afford to go out and you're looking in your bank account all the time hoping that there's £10 in it, you're obsessed. But you're obsessed about what you haven't got, which is money. I'm not obsessed about money anymore because I've got plenty of it and I don't have to obsess over it. So that's, you know, I have focused on money. I have made it my mission to make money and and tried to do it in a a fair and ethical and sustainable way. So here's why I I love money. And I'm I'm good. We were talking about how to make it in a fair and a sustainable way. Was that important to you before you had money? Or is that something that you arrived to? Okay, so... um, I think when you're broke, it's okay to be a bit selfish, i.e. I just need to get out of debt. I'll do whatever needs to be done. You know, I'm not, I'm not a philanthropist, I just need to get out of debt. Mm. But once you've made a lot of money, you're not going to grow that wealth unless you help a lot of people. You know, in my formula for wealth, um, which is perceived value plus fair exchange times leverage, leverage is the amount of people you reach or the amount of units you sell. Um, and once you've become financially free or a millionaire or a billionaire then um you know making money becomes something bigger than just the money itself because you don't just need the money itself now some people it's power corruption and control but for many people it's legacy it's giving back i mean buffett's donating billions to the melinda and bill gates foundation so I think when I became a, 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 a more than a million, but less than 10 million net worth, a low level millionaire, I was like, this is nearly enough now. And, you know, I could get a hundred grand watch or a 200 grand car and it, it's nice, but it doesn't really impact my life. But I could use my leverage of my following on social media and I could do a charity raise and raise 120 grand or... Um, I've done quite a lot of things for my Rob Moore Foundation. At the same time, though, I'm, we were, like, I just went to buy a piece of Tom York's art. So I don't know if you know Radiohead. was one of my favourite bands. And there's an exhibition. I just bought a piece of his art. Um, and Harry was like, well, you know, you're not going to get a commission out of Tom York because he's just not that kind of guy. And he said, you know, but I bet you'd do a commission, you know, for the right money. You know, for 10 million, would you copy a Picasso from a billionaire? I wouldn't copy a Picasso for a billionaire for 10 million because I can't copy a, Cap- a Picasso but I would say to the billionaire but you would if you could well I would if I could but I can't 
so I'm not a fraud. But what I would say to the billionaire is, I'll tell you what I'll do. For five million, I'll do you the best piece of art that I can do. And I'm uh, like, give, give me as many billionaires as you like and I'm doing pieces for five million quid. And if you, you are, there you go. Mm. So I think we all have a price and there's things that we can commercialise and there's nothing wrong with that. As long as you're being authentic. I wouldn't be authentic if I charged someone 10 million to pay, paint a Picasso because I can't paint a Picasso. But what I am authentic in is saying, how about what I can do? I'll give you five million, fine, done. Mm. So that's kind of how I see money. Um, you know, I have a fair keynote speaking fee and I think my, that what I offer is fair for that and then I do some for free mm. and sometimes I'm paid to be on podcasts and sometimes I do them for free but you can only make that choice when you've built your own level of wealth so I think when you're broke you probably are more selfish and it's okay to be more selfish because number one you need to look after you you can only look after your family once you've looked after you you can only look after your community once you've looked after your family mm. but once you've built wealth I mean, if you look at rich people, I mean, there's a lady, I won't mention her name, but she gives a lot of money to charity, but she's one of the richest billionaires in the UK from gambling. And people say, oh, from gambling. I mean, I don't like gambling at all. I'd like to outlaw gambling. I think mm. it's just terrible. Um, but she would argue that it's entertainment and it's necessary if it wasn't necessary. Now, I'm not judging her. I've not met her, but I know, I, I know of the story. I tried to have her on my podcast. Um, why? But why? Mm. So then I could challenge her on these things. Mm. Um, but someone like that might say, well, there's plenty of other gambling firms and this is how we do it better. And people will always pay for entertainment. So you've got to have your own morals and judgments as to what you're prepared to commercialise and what you're not. I used to be an artist and most artists have a real problem with commercial commercialization, and they don't ever make enough money. And when you don't make enough money, you can't express your own art. Mm -hmm. Like you couldn't do this podcast without these good cameras. You've got a good new camera there. You've got good microphones. They're very good. If you, if you had, like, if I came here and you had a little Zoom H1 and you're holding it under my, I'm going to be like, hmm, you need to invest in this, in this <laughs> podcast. Um, so yeah, so you had an original question. And then you asked me the question I just answered. Can you remember the original question? Why are you obsessed with money? That you're not obsessed with, but you... I'm fascinated by yes. it. Yes. I think it's... Well, tell me the top five subjects that humans think about. And I'd be amazed if, in you did a wider poll, money's not in the top five. No, I'm sure. I mean, I think Health, money is one of the most... Family. ...argued about... Money, yeah. So ...conversations it, so, with, so between couples. Money could be in the top three or five things that's most talked about about humanity and it is out of all of those in my opinion the least understood mm. like I, I have done 17 years of research and study around money I've written books on money I've just written my 20th book and the last two I've written on money and people don't know anything about money most people do not know anything about money yeah it's in the top three or five things that we talk, we talk about on a daily basis so um is that not the most fascinating of subjects to try and find out how it works? Now, one thing I'll talk about money is I'll, I'm going to I want people to do this exercise. I think it's really fascinating. So, anyone listening or watching, just follow me and do this. Imagine the nicest street in your area. If you do this with me as well, and imagine driving down that nicest street and parking outside the nicest house like the one you'd love, the dream house. And take a look through your car window, and don't worry, no one's going to think you're a weirdo, but take a look out through and look at this grand house and think about what kind of person you perceive owns that house. Like, picture them. Mm -hmm. Are they a man or a woman? Are they old or are they young? Are they a drug dealer or an artist? Or do they, um, are they on the board of Facebook? I don't know. I don't want to put things into people's heads. But here's the thing. You don't know who lives in that house. And you're going to build a picture of the person that you think lives in that house and you have no idea. Now, I'll tell you the picture I'd build. Entrepreneur, made loads of money, probably smart. I'd want to go and ring the doorbell and talk to them. I should maybe get them on my podcast. Whereas when I was broke, I think probably the biggest drug dealer in town, cleaning money, money launderer, criminal, because that was a reflection of my own. So the person you picture is the rich person, is an internal reflection reflected out but that's a fictionary fictional character it's not a real character that i that story i think embodies money in that money is neutral it, 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 is this plastic good or bad like, like it, it's a piece of plastic it's not good 
if I give it to you, it's good. Why is it good if you give it to me? Because I've done a kind gesture. But there's no expectations. No. I mean, if I give it to you with expectations, it's not good. But isn't it all just about how we perceive humanity and our own deep-seated beliefs? Not just about yes. money, but what it, everything that it represents. Yes. Because so, if you give me something, and if I believe like, oh, people are generous, then mm, it's like, okay, yeah. great. And I, or I then you will great. Yeah. So you will gratefully yeah. receive. Yeah. And you will look at everyone like they're generous, mm. and you will send out that frequency and that vibration, and you'll get that back. Mm. Whereas if you're like, because if I handed that to you and you don't want. Ugh, no, and and scowled at me mm. and, and be like, what do you want? What are you trying to buy? I'd be like, oh, okay, I better not do that again. So your perception of money and how you view it this is This is you. neutral. This, this is what you think this is, mm. but this isn't what you think it is. That's mm. the, par the dual paradox of money. So dual paradox is anything can be good or bad depending on how you perceive it. So mm. AI... Good thing about AI is it could probably save a million lives. Bad thing about AI is it could probably take a million lives. So this I could give to 20 poor kids in the third world with genuine intent. And I could probably feed them for a week. Mm. With this one, I could buy a magazine of 20 bullets and get a gun and go and shoot 20 kids in a school. Which money isn't any of those things. It becomes what I project onto it. So... I use the, the analogy in my new book, Money Matrix, about a hammer. So if I put a hammer on the table, you probably wouldn't judge that hammer. You know what that's for. Oh, there's a couple of pictures there that look like they, they need putting up. But I could take that hammer and smash your skull in with it. You wouldn't try the hammer and you wouldn't judge the hammer and you wouldn't say hammers are the root of all evil. It would be me who would be in front of the judge and the jury money's like a hammer a hammer's really good at nailing in a nail and lev levering one out it's better than your hand this is good at going to Pret-a-Manger or um, where is it we went Harry Leon and get mm. oh, I've got a delicious fish finger sandwich I, like, I'm a sucker for a fish finger sandwich I paid £7.50 for a um, fish finger sandwich now imagine if I had to try and barter £7.50's worth I had to go, go into Leon and go ooh I'll do you £7.50's worth of a dance you know, to try and get this, it's not, not efficient. So this is a tool like a hammer. With a hammer, you can smash someone's skull in or you can go and create a beautiful piece of art and go and use a hammer to put it up on the wall and give someone joy. This is what people don't understand about money. They think money is what they are, but money is what it is. So if you want to change what money is, you have to change what you are. Why is it important to you to teach others that money is neutral? Um, I guess because I was broken and I've been rich. And a lot of people judge the rich. But um, Why did you judge the rich? Because I was broke and I wanted to be rich and I wasn't rich. And I looked at the rich and I thought you must have done that illegally or inherited it or, or been a drug dealer. So you didn't have like a good examples of how you can earn your money in non-illegal terrible ways. Oh no, I didn't have any examples of how to make money because I wasn't around people who made money. Mm. If I'd have been around people who made money and were generous and giving, that I would see people who made money as generous and giving. So to you know, your your environment as well as your family and the media and things like that that impacts what you think money is. Inside I was bitter and resentful. I knew that I should have been an entrepreneur. I knew that I wanted to make money and I knew that I could, but I'd failed in my life in that that department and so I saw everyone else as a success as lucky or done it illegally because that made it okay for me to fail inside and I'm a bit ashamed about that and I'm really glad that I've changed that about myself so because I've changed that about myself and I like myself better and my life is better for that change why would I want not want to share that with other people also I mean if if the whole of society knew this and I was the last to know I wouldn't need to talk about it because I was the last to get it. But no one fucking gets it. Like you hear people say all the time, well, money doesn't buy you happiness. Mm. Buys you nice cameras, buys you a nice microphone, buys you a nice school for your kids. I so, mean, I don't believe that money doesn't A lot of people happiness. do, though. They do. And there's all these studies saying, oh, after £70,000 that it's you're no longer happier. But what, happiness, and I love what you talk about happiness, as in 
it's an emotion. It's part of a range of emotions that we experience. It's mm. not just a stand like, oh, I'm happy and now I'm happy for the oh, rest yeah, there's of probably, my life. There's dozens of happiness emotions. You're there's right. There's different ways of being happy. And I think one of the first and times... And one of them is to make a lot of money. <laughs> well, I mean, it's the thrill. It's the dopamine hit. It's, it's more, more than a dopamine hit. Well, you yeah. know, you, you, you are a better judge about that. <laughs> hey, you have more money in the bank <laughs> than I do. So, you know, I'll take it from you. Mm. But, you know, it... It does help to, you know, it buys you safety, it buys you security, it buys health. you health, it buys you time, it mm. buys you a lot of things that make you happy eventually. So yeah. I'm or make you your life that. easier. Yes. And so therefore you can focus your anxieties on other things. Because mm. money doesn't take all your problems away. In fact, money sometimes makes bigger problems. I know this. Um, but when you don't have to worry about money, you can focus your anxieties in important areas to you, like your children, like your career, mm. like seeing the world before you die, mm. you know, all these kind of things. But, you know, you say that you don't think that money doesn't buy happiness. But, I mean, in, in the Bible, it says that um, the love of money is the root of all evil. No. Humanity is the root of all evil. Not money. This can't be evil. It's not conscious. But it's what people do with it. Yeah, so it's the human, not the money. Yes, true. But so the Bible you, was wrong. you're a person who doesn't have money and you watch how, you know, the revolutions have been started over smaller things like that, but you mm. see somebody who, large groups of people who don't know how to get it, who don't understand it, who resent it or see it as something terrible because they may see the rich and it's like, well, why do they get to have that? And then also, you know, showing their flashy cars, driving those Ferraris that you're resentful of or, you know, going on these holidays and yet not contributing to the rest of the society. So you are involved so did charity. you say that people buy all those things and don't contribute to society i'm not saying they don't well they do by buying all those things the government controls the flow of money well, from the rich to the poor so people like to blame the rich and the government like people to blame the rich it's the government that distribute money the worst because taxes mm. is money distribution so my question is, do the rich have an obligation to make sure that some of that wealth is distributed downwards? Hmm, that's a good question. I've not been asked that before in that way. Um, I think to a certain degree, yes, but they already do. You just don't know it. And let's use me as an example. I pay millions of pounds in taxes. Taxes is wealth distribution. I am already distributing millions of my pounds from my own coffers down to the recipients of tax, which is everyone else. Um, but here's the problem. The government managed that money really badly. So the mainstream media and the governments would love the rich to be blamed. So it's a distraction over there. It's not the government's fault. But if crime is high, the police is so underfunded, the NHS is drastically underfunded. Do you know, basically, um, theft is basically legal now because only one in 40 thefts actually come to a prosecution. Do you know there's so much rape that goes on that is basically legal now because it doesn't get properly investigated? I am paying my taxes to redistribute my wealth that I fucking earned and gave 17 years of my life for to trust the state that it will distribute it, and it doesn't. And I have to pay for the NHS. I, I've got a, a, a little... I've got some numbness in parts of my body at the moment. I'm a bit worried about it. I just want to get it checked. Mm -hmm. um, it might be nothing. But I have to go to private to be able to get that checked. And someone in my organisation, she passed away through lockdown. And she probably wouldn't have if she could have got in a hospital. And that angers me. So every time, like, I'll spend money all around here. And um, so when a rich person goes to a new city, because, you know, you get tourism, you get money from other countries. Well, any time a rich person goes through any town or city, they're throwing money all over the place. They might not be going, oh, here's 200 quid in a donation. And I'll go, where are all the homeless people? I'll give them a million pounds. But they're buying clothes and they're buying watches and they're buying art and they're buying fancy cakes and, and everything else. Um, so that is also a form of 
distribution of wealth. So the rich people distribute wealth already. They're not given the credit for it, and they do it better than the government. Could some do it more? Well, that's up for debate. I mean, Warren Buffett is giving away billions. And it's easy for someone sitting and go, yeah, but he's worth 300 billion and he's only given away 100 billion and he's got 200 billion left, so he should give away another 200 billion. No, you go and fucking earn another 200 billion and then you give it away. Mm -hmm. And what are these people who are judging all these rich people doing? Nothing. They're they're being trolls on on social media. So, uh, and also don't forget how the rich people pay or don't pay their tax is supposed to be regulated and controlled by the government. If you were a billionaire and you could pay 4% tax or 20% tax, which one are you going to choose? Well, for sure. Like, I wouldn't want to pay tax if I didn't have to. There you go. Yeah. So if you, if you can get an accountant and a good lawyer yeah. and you can get 4% instead of 20%, you're going to choose 4%. Yeah. Everyone listening to would probably charge 4%. And let's say you felt a bit guilty about that. Well, you're like, well, 4% of bill- billions is still a lot. And I'll give a few million away to charity and I'll set up a foundation. You know, naturally, you're going to, through your own emotions, you know, give money away and, and do good things. You can't do good things when you don't have any money other than maybe rent your time that's true but my question also stems from once and this is again making assumptions that everyone's like that and they're not but there are groups of very rich individuals who become so isolated from you know even if they came from poverty or from you know not having money once you end up in this world of driving luxurious cars and being surrounded in, you know, that becomes standard to you. That doesn't become extraordinary. It's just what you get on a day-to-day basis. Why is that a problem? That's not a problem for them. Because everybody a, come, becomes normalised by their surroundings, don't they? They do, but being so far removed from how the rest of the world lives and then becoming either judgmental about like oh well they're just like poor people they don't they're stupid because let's face it like not everybody i've has- never met a rich person ever mm. and i know a lot that's mm. ever said oh they're just poor people they're stupid never entertain me is it possible that a rich person may say that right um it's possible it's yes. possible that a poor person could say that the rich is a hoity-toity, upper-class snob. Yes. Neither of the, neither of each actually really know each other. No, but the more you get separated into these categories, the more you don't understand each other. And that's why I'm saying is like, should the rich who have gone through, especially the ones who have self-made, or they have gone from that process of not having money to having money, understanding how the rest of the world lives, should, don't they bear some responsibility to right some of the wrongs that they have seen along the way? Because does it matter which way you make money? Like, are there things that you shouldn't be doing? Well, to me, it matters. To, right. I think it matters to anyone, and they will justify why they make money. I make money through training and education and information, and I think it's a hugely beneficial to society way of um, me making money. But some people say, oh, yeah, but you can just go on YouTube and, and borrow a book off someone and go to the library. Well, if you could do that and get rich, you'll be creating a course on that and ironically become the thing that you hate. I personally would never make money out of gambling it's, it's not, it's because I don't believe that that helps people with money. But I bet if you had someone who owned a big gambling company here, they would justify it. Mm. So um, I have my own ethics and morals. You have your own ethics and morals. Um, so you, you, you mentioned in your description, do rich people have some obligation to right the wrongs along the way? I, I think you have to get to know some rich people and listen to their story. Because if you've interviewed 100 or 1,000 rich people and they're all oligarch greedy, capitalist, power-hungry, corrupt, then, you know, there needs to be a bit of a shake-up. But I haven't ever interviewed any of those. Now, maybe there are some and they're hiding in a communist country or they won't go on podcasts. I don't know. But I've interviewed 20 billionaires. I am wealthy. I know loads of rich people. And, you know, they do a lot of good in society. Mm. They give millions away. They set up charities and foundations. Well, what is better? Someone who earns 20 grand a, a, a year and they give away 
a thousand pounds or someone who earns a hundred million a year and they give away a million pounds because the million is less of a percentage than the 200 million but it's a hell of a lot more than 500 quid mm. i would argue that you can do more good with the million but there are more people who have 20,000 than there are people who have several million so if all of those people did that on mass but they don't so it, it's sort of very well pointing the finger at the rich that they should be giving away more. What I think someone should do is start with themselves. So yeah, if everyone who earns 20 grand a year gave away 500 pounds, the world would be a better place. Most people who earn 10, 20 grand a year don't give away 500 pounds. Mm. But, but go and ask a load of them. They, they would probably think they can't afford it. Uh, anyone I know who makes 100 million gives at least a, a million or 2 million or 5 million or 10 million of that away. And don't forget everywhere they, they go, because you said they drive nice cars. Well, do you know there's a mechanic that repairs that car? who gets paid a lot of money. Uh, you know, that mechanic couldn't run his living if he didn't have some rich clients. And, you know, if you ask anyone who's got rich clients, their rich clients are their favourite clients. And their rich clients tip them big. Go to a restaurant, it's the rich people who tip big. It's not the, you know, the poor people who tip big. I'm not judging the poor, by the way. Um, we're here on this interview interrogation table. Um, I'm not because you don't hear me ever going around judging the poor and by the way if someone is broken happy I tip my hat and all good mm. because you know would I take being broken happy over rich and unhappy I actually would I would you know I don't think I could be broke and happy and I think I can be rich and happy but if you've got a gun to my head and it's broke but happy genuinely or rich and unhappy. I'd take broke and happy. I think you could be rich and happy. I'm pretty happy. And I'm pretty rich. I'm not going around judging anyone who's broke and happy. What I'm trying to do is educate people who are broke and unhappy. And help them change their lives. That's my mission. And there's a lot... That's hard. Because they have all these beliefs. And you know, you've expressed some of them here. And any, any anti-rich belief is all going to mean you're always going to repel money. Notice you haven't taken the 20. <laughs> I have a problem with money. I do. Well, you can give it all to me then, because I don't. Looking back now... You still need to I tell do. me about how you judged me. I, I will. For me, the money comes with conditions, or it has come with conditions in the past. So that's been my personal yeah, experience. But the past doesn't have to dictate the no. future. And, and it's taken years of work to unpack some Good. of those things, which are not just to do with money but you're money aware of it. of it you're yes, conscious of it and you're I trying have, to change it yes yeah and i am completely 100 percent with you in terms of educating people around the topic and i'm not saying the rich are bad and i'm no. not saying i'm not no, judging the poor i'm kind of playing devil's advocate yeah. in terms of understanding your perspective and talking about you know miss miss what's the word what's the word now misogyny no, we'll get Miss. to that. Oh, okay. Don't worry, that's the next topic. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Put my foot in it there. Um, so we've got... Misconceptions. Right. Talking about Such. how I felt about you. I think it was, as I didn't see you, your face, it was your voice. Mm. And your voice triggered me. Oh, wow. It did. And the swearing. Yeah. So that triggered me as well. So what, what about the, my voice triggered you? Just Is it harsh or is it aggressive or it was, loud or... um i'm trying to i'm trying to think don't dance around it no i'm not trying to dance around it i'm trying to find the right words to express it to the best of my ability so mm. that it's correct yeah for what i'm actually remember english is my second language yeah <laughs> um it was triggering me because i felt that you were almost shouting at the people and trying to convince them of a certain point of view and swearing and i didn't listen to it that much so i didn't really get into get involved mm. in the conversations and i don't remember precisely what you were saying but then when i went and i was watching some of the YouTube videos, the podcast, and some of the conversations that you had when people do grill you and do challenge you, what you say is more in line with my values than how you say it. But I think, you know, in person, you also come across as different mm. than when you come across on the screen. Yeah. Because well, well, it was an audio. It wasn't even, like you said, it wasn't even a face, was it? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I'm always fascinated by those first impressions. 
I don't really have a problem with that mm. because it's something that you noticed. And I'd rather you notice me than you didn't. And I also know it's not... It, I am that? me. Why is that? Yeah. Why well, do if you, you want don't, to be noticed? Well, if you don't notice me, I can't come on your podcast. Can't get my message out to people. We can't possibly collaborate in the future. You know, I know you've done a good couple of hundred episodes. Well, maybe you might bring me back on your 500th if this is, you know, really well downloaded. We might see each other at a podcast show sometime. And we're going to, you know, we've, we've started a relationship, a collaboration or whatever. But if you don't know who I am, that can, that can never happen. So does it, does it matter how you get attention? Well, I, I don't, I'm not being me just for attention. I'm being me because I am me. So it's not delivery is what you're saying. That's just how... I'm being me. Yeah. Well, well, I am definitely being me a lot more now at age 44 than I was age 35 or 25. Here's the irony. I was most confused about me at ages 14 and 21. Um, and I was probably trying to be much more of something than I wasn't. But I used to hate that about myself, but I don't now because we're all trying to find who we are. Mm. And I, I don't know how you felt as you, you know, move from 20s to 30s, but I'd probably say in my 30s, there was really good discovery about who I am. Mm. And probably between, you know, the late 30s and early 40s, I'm like, I'm actually quite happy and content and comfortable. I'll give you an example. I don't like the way I sound. You know, if I were to... If I were to listen to myself back on this audio, I would not like how I sound. I would much more like to speak like this. And my daughter, she speaks so well. She's so posh and she speaks like this. And daddy. And many times I've thought I should try and practice speaking differently. But it's just not me. Mm. I am me. And so swearing is... I'm not trying to trigger you by swearing... I'm swearing, I've sworn a couple of times in this episode, it's up to you whether you um, beep it out or not, but I'm swearing when I'm passionate. You know, I wasn't being rude to you, you, you know, when I was defending the rich, you know, I was, which I'm, yeah, someone needs to. Are you to. defending the rich? <laughs> I'm, in some regard, yes, against mm. mainstream media and governmental propaganda, yeah, because remember, it, let's just go back to that. Imagine if all the taxes you gave to Elon Musk and Richard Branson in the UK and America, who would you bet would use that money best for society? The governments or Richard Branson in the UK and Elon Musk in America? I don't know them well enough to comment, but from the way that government has been behaving, I go. don't have much no, faith in that they, there you go yeah, yeah so um how you judged me um like yeah i would rather you judged me than you didn't know me i mean would you know is the soft nice cuddly fluffy side of me want everyone to like me on first instance well yeah but you that's said a, that you that's o that's only an insecure version of me who doesn't know themselves like you know you meet people and they're just like your best friend straight away you should smell a rat because they're probably a narcissist. So I'd much rather re meet someone, I'm like, yeah, they're authentic, rather than, oh, love you, love you, love you. And, and I, you know, I was authentic on Clubhouse, I really was. I, I didn't ever come out of a room thinking, ugh, I've made my skin crawl there, I didn't like who I was. I mean, sometimes I was testing racy headlines, and sometimes I was having a discussion and debate with someone, which I like. Mm. But, you know, I would rather you get triggered by me and remember me for being who I am mm. than like me for someone I'm not. So I'll, I'll take that. We're here. We're now. Yeah, I'm actually, one of my favourite questions, which you use in your podcast, is like, I don't remember exactly how you phrase it, but how I phrase it is like, what misconceptions do people have usually about you? Mm. So what's that? Um. I think that they think I'm maybe a little bit more mercenary and capitalist than I actually am. What do you think gives people that impression? I'm the guy that will talk about anything about money, whereas most people in this country, they worry about being judged for talking about it. I'll give you an example. I was in a telegram group and someone said, well, you know what, most millionaires, they're pretty humble and, you know, they drive German cars and, you know, they don't flash their wealth. And I said to him, and I was being, I was really honest, I said to him, I really respect that. I really admire someone who's got in the low level millions and is living a humble life and is not showing it off. 
But I couldn't live like that because I fucking love cars and I love watches and I loved them since I was a kid. I loved the Ferrari Testarossa 1987 and I bought one. And that's just not me. And to be able to, like, be authentic and be honest. Like, if you ask most men if they would take 10 million quid and buy... In fact, ask most men what your favourite... What your top three cars? Your daily, your classic, and, you know, and your hypercar. And then they said, and then you said, oh, you can have them because I'm Mr. Beast and I'm giving away cars. None of them go, nah, I don't want them. No, no, no. So most men want cars. Not all. But most. But we all have passions. And some, for some people it's collecting comics and whatever else. But, you know, money gives you the ability to do that. And for years I was like, oh, well, maybe I should be more humble. And then social media comes along and it wants you to do clickbait. So then I'm like, maybe I should be more rah-rah and blingy. Mm. More humble, more braggy. More humble, more braggy. And, you, and in the end, hopefully, you find your own voice. And I do feel like for maybe... Eight years now. If you go back through my content, I think in the early years, I'm a bit strained. I think the intention is good, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Mm. But you can tell I'm a bit strained. Like, I was much more shouty when I was younger. I was, I was much more... In fact, I was, all these in-your-face people now, I was kind of a bit before the time. But I don't know. It was a bit not me. So th- and then what so happened... The shouty- part is not you. I mean, if you watch me on stage on a live talk, you hear me shout and rant. Well, and you're on stage, you need to be heard at the go. back of the room. I get that. Yeah. Like, I come from a family of performers. That makes sense to me. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I'm, I'm all, all mm. over the place. Um, and then what happened was, you know, I'd get a lot of attention and then my business partner, my MD and my wife are like, oh, you know, it's a lot of attention here. Maybe we should just calm down a bit. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. and they always like, tried to basically dilute me. And it lasted about two years, and basically all of them, in their own words, said, we want Rob back. So they'd sort of suppressed me. This is why it's important to be around good people. I know I allowed it, but, yeah, I think, um, you know, when I was on, in Clubhouse, I think I was pretty authentic. Um, yeah, and here's the thing. In, in the world of personal development, you've got my friend Mark Victor Hansen. Don't think I've ever heard him swear. Lovely, articulate, very fast-thinking man. You've got another fast-thinking man called Gary Vaynerchuk, who's got this broad accent, accent, who's quite aggressive. I mean, you think I'm aggressive? Nothing like Gary no, Vee. I'm nothing like Andrew I Tate. What he you says know. is good, but I can't, I can't hear the There you voice. go. Yeah. But, you know, maybe Gary's style isn't mine, but I know he's a smart guy, and I know I can listen to him on social media. But, you know, he's, he, he Fs and Jeffs every five seconds. Like, I, I think I've only said fuck three times now and twice before. Um, <laughs> So, it depends, you know, maybe that, you know, was... Maybe I'm somewhere in the middle. I don't know. But. I don't think you need to justify it. I, think I don't. Pro- You're I right. Probably, I probably felt some sort of sense of not being included if I wasn't allowed into the room and I wasn't part of the, the listening... Like, and there the was me, the, the 80th followed person in the world on Clubhouse who thought go. he was the big Dom yes. who ran the room. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's very honest of you. Well, I think that probably was part of it. I mean, that whole... That whole era... I used to, by the way, bring a lot of people up in rooms and give people equal opportunity because someone did that to me at the start. I didn't know how to use Clubhouse. (laughs) And I was just in a a random room and someone brought me up and said, all right, mate, go talk to people. He was an American guy called Farrokh who, you know, I stayed in touch with. And I I remembered that. So I always tried to do that. So forgive me if I didn't do that with you. That's okay. You probably did at one point. Yeah. Probably wasn't enough for me somehow. <laughs> yeah. well, I was feeling really down and wanted to <laughs> yeah. get that sense of in, importance. In an anxiety from mode or whatever. Yeah. 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 Talking about clickbait, what have you learned in terms of how far is too far? Well, Harry, my producer over there, um, there is no too far. Right. Did you hear? I, I hope you pick up that little <laughs> that you got in the battery. Like he. Our most clickbaity content is the one that's done the best. David Icke and Jordan Peterson and Andrew Tate and Katie Hopkins. Um, I had a brilliant conversation with Matt Goss about this. He, I, I'm, I'm going to have lunch with him tomorrow. He was on my show. And it was a, a, a lovely conversation. He's a lovely man. Um, and, and he was like, look, Rob, just, you know, this is, just, just do this justice. Just, you know, be kind. So he's basically like, don't put some cheap clickbaity thumbnail headline mm. over. I guess he would see it like as a beautiful painting that you just slapped some mm. random paint on and you're ruined. And in some ways, I'm a bit, I'm an artist at heart. In my old days, I was an artist. So I feel the same. 
I, I want the conversation to be quality. That's what I want. I would like you to leave thinking that was a good quality conversation, even if you've got more judgments than you have answers. I don't mind. Mm. But unfortunately, that doesn't sell. What sells it is the thumbnail and the headline. So I, I regularly have this conversation on my podcast with especially arty, creative types. In, you know, the art is the piece of content. This is the art form. And the gimmick is the thumbnail. <gasps> and, you know, and the Rob Moore tr trashes my house. Um, or I mean, because Harry sometimes he puts headlines in, and I'm like, mate, that didn't happen in the episode. All right, so just blame Harry. Yeah, yeah, okay. well, it's great to have a Harry. Well, you you can you've got you can you can blame your <laughs> my husband. Yeah, yeah, um, but yeah, sometimes I say to Harry that didn't actually happen. Mm. He's like, but we need the clicks. Mm. Yeah, but we don't need to be desperate for the clicks. But. I have got a lot of really good content out there that's not got many views and I've got some stuff which I would deem a little bit more tacky that's got millions of views. Mm. I don't have the answer to that question mm. because let's say you're an artist. Um, the art is the piece of art. The clickbait is how many people come and look at that piece of art. Yeah. If you have no one looking at the art, You've, you're doing. You're spending all this money and time on podcasts. I mean, there's two of you here, and you've got all this equipment, thousands of pounds. If no one listens to this podcast, it's it. No, it's like, do you exist? Well, exactly. Well, yeah. nothing exists in a vacuum. But at everything what dies cost? in a vacuum, like, including podcasts. If mm. no one listens to a podcast, it will die. Mm. So, um, let me ask it back to you. How far would you go on the clickbait? Not that far. I've been scared to do that. And that's probably resulting in less probably of a growth. Probably held you back. Yeah. It probably does. I think it's something that I need to learn more about in terms of how can it be truthful to what's really happening. But also, it's the art of storytelling. It's about how do you express what's really going on, what's the most dramatic point of the video. But I also think podcasting and YouTube is a long game. So... If you're putting in things that didn't happen, eventually people will stop believing you. It's like the boy that cried wolf. Mm. And also, if you don't have a good title for the conversation that you had, you probably need to spend more time working on your content and how you can be a better interviewer and have better guests and how can you tell a better story versus just putting one clickbait title on yeah. it so that's my perspective yeah um, i mean can i just jump in here yeah. quickly i think there's two types of clickbait i think there's the miss sell the bullshit yeah the bait and switch which is where clickbait comes from it came from porn where you're clicking on something and it goes to porn um and then there's really creative good quality maybe racy headlines that are delivered on in the content. Well, that's different. And that's art. Yes. To create a so great that, yeah. title that everyone clicks and doesn't bait and switch, that's art. In fact, Harry and I should spend more time on our headlines and on the thumbnails. And we spend a lot more now than we used to. Because if you can get a headline which is like makes you click and isn't a bait and switch, you're a headline genius. And because mm. the more head, the more clicks you can get, the more views you get, the more views you get, the more on the For You page or the related searches. And it is a virtuous cycle. So let's address the other elephant in the room. What if it's a guest that is not good for society? Like, how far do you... I mean, well, you've interviewed... Define who's not... Define what's... Tate. I think that's loaded in your own moral judgments. It is. I think that there are about 25 million men that would say Andrew Tate is good for society. And that terrifies me. Yeah. So I'm not judging you. I'm just trying to be pick out your own judgments. So because who judges who is good for society and who is not good for society? Society? Well, why was he much of, much of society loves Andrew Tate. Much of society despises Andrew Tate. I think if you are a mother of a daughter, you're probably more naturally inclined to not like Andrew Tate. I think if you're a struggling, fatherless, 25-year-old male, you're more likely to. Um, so why do young men like him? 
Well, now let's go back to your first question first, because I don't think we've finished that. I don't think you or I, so I certainly can't, I can't speak for you. I can't judge that Andrew Tate is bad for society. Who am I to make that judgment? Because I... You don't think he's a misogynist? Well... Do you think he's a misogynist? My personal experience of him, I've had a lot of personal experience with him. I know him, message him quite a lot. I don't know how much personal experience you've had with him. Um, my guess none. is none. So, so um, I have never seen any misogyny from him. But why would there be misogyny with me? I'm wait, not wait, a wait, twenty wait, year old. Wait, wait. I'm talking about my personal yes, experience the podcast and with I've him. I've heard with him. Yeah. So, 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 so to answer your question, personally. I've had no misogyny, but why would I? And but I did, from your podcast. Okay, well, we can come to that. Don't worry, yeah. I'll talk about anything. Let, let me just sort of... I think the nuance is really important here. I think, because mm. I do, and I'm mm. your guest. So just bear, bear <laughs> okay. with me on All that. Right. And as you're the host, you can disagree. But let me get my point out first. Um, so my experience has only been good from start to finish with him. And... That's what I'm going to judge on, number one. Now, by the way, does my wife think the same thing? No. So if we need to open that, we can. Um, at the moment... So, hold on. Yeah, so let, now let me get to the personal, trial bit. Personal experience, so let, talk me through that. What does that mean in terms of how he behaved towards you, in terms of the qualities that you see in him that align with yours? Well, don't forget, all I've done is... Met him, interviewed with him on a podcast, carried on talking to him. He's messaged me a few times saying that he likes some of my guests on my show and we're talking about a second interview. So that's as far as I've done. I don't go over to his house every weekend. I don't body spa with him. I'm not, you know, one of the, one of the guy. I'm not one of the killers. Uh, I, if I'm ever around anyone in, associated with Andrew Tate, I always smile on the videos because they always don't. So I'm still me. I'm, yeah. you know, but like, I'm not scared of an association with him because I am not society and I'm not going to morally judge. Now, would I be concerned of a, um, an association with Jeffrey Epstein? Of course I would. But I think that's proven. Andrew Tate is... It's, there's no proof yet. And, and like, if you were questioned about something and you were on trial but there was no actual case mm -hmm. you know and there was then you would want a fair trial and is there actually a case being presented here or not because there still isn't any there's still not been any charges now look could therefore some of my people think well there's going to be a bit of egg on rob's face if he does convict get convicted of those if he gets convicted of those and there are proof then i might change my stance I, I probably would change my stance to be honest but i'd have to wait and see what they are but i'm not judging until they are. but as of yet there are no charges and i like to think if i was accused of something that i didn't believe i was guilty of mm. people that knew me wouldn't judge me because there's not even any charges social media is not judge, jury and executioner, but it's made itself that. Mainstream media, like BBC, you know, they're hatchet, hatcheting him, him because they want to, they want oxygen. Like the hit jobs from the BBC were terrible journalism, whether they might have been right, but terrible journalism. And it was a vain attempt to have some oxygen left to survive because BBC are very irrelevant now. You watch my interview with him compared to BBC's. Way, way more balanced, I mean, balanced, I actually don't watch interviews with him. And the only reason oh, is fair because, yeah, you know, we're doing, the re the, doing research on you. And obviously he's... It, okay, I'm a woman. I have heard the things he says, both on your podcast and elsewhere. And I go onto your YouTube page your podcast and go into the most popular videos and there's probably at least three or four of i mean jordan peterson number one but a lot of of him and i think i scrolled maybe about 20 30 and i saw three female faces mm. so because he's so popular on your podcast it is giving 
him a bigger platform exactly he at doesn't the point, need me he doesn't need he do, me but but you are still offering that to him so the katie hopkins she was but let me let me let me, <laughs> let me because you know you're you're no, more you. experienced in this and i yeah. want to like articulate myself i hear you um i think you're doing a bit well thank you um he he is a person that was cancelled at that point he is somebody who in my opinion encourages young men to think about women in the wrong way. To me, that is not good for society because I believe in female empowerment. As a female entrepreneur myself, it is terrifying to see that somebody mm. of that grand scale of influence being supported by people like you and other people because he is a nice person to deal with. Because in my opinion, an individual is, especially when they have such a broad reach, has a responsibility and has to take account accountability for their actions. So mm. just because he's not been convicted of whatever crimes that he's been accused of, that still he's still saying very misogynistic and very untrue things about women, both outside of your platform and on your platform. So it's like, how do you feel about that? Do you not feel like he was giving misogynistic views on your show? Okay, so first off, I totally respect that position. And I have conversations with my wife about this quite a lot. My wife's very good at giving me balance. I am a man, so I'm obviously going to learn much more about a, a woman's point of view from a woman. My wife's very kind, very balanced, very logical. And we have these discussions and, you know, I don't think she would mind me to say she, a lot of these things and more. She's raised in the conversation. She's even raised, you know, if I should think about that with my association. So there's a couple of things I want to address going back before we move forward. And um, I'm in this position on my podcast where I don't know if... I don't know what, why this happened... But we have had so many really brilliant females agreed to be on the show and then they cancel once, twice, three and four times. And I've, I've openly talked about this and I don't mind talking about it here and I'll probably get some hate for it, but I I mean, I'll tell less. you what, I was, uh, but, 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 I was wait, in two minds of, yeah, in having you on the show. Okay, that, that, that's interesting. And obviously we'll talk afterwards whether you think it was a good decision or not and I'll, I'll accept whatever. But by the way, the, the, many of these females was way, it was pre Andrew Tate, it was pre Jordan Peterson, it was when all the people I was interviewing were entrepreneurs, that none of them were in any way controversial. Because if you go back and look at my early stuff, none of the guests are controversial. They're just all entrepreneurs. It used to be called the disruptive entrepreneur. So you can see the evolution. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we had Joe Malone. We had Hilary DeVay, unfortunately, has passed away, and loads of others. And I don't want to sit here and name and shame, but they fucked us around. Yeah, come here. Oh, no. 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 Yeah, no. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. You know, we had the um, Jacqueline Gold, you know, associated with West Ham, and she pulled out to, to illness when we knew she was watching the Champions League match. That's... So, uh, so in, are in my... So you saying women are flaky? No. I am not saying women are flaky. Rem you know, remember, I'm the guy on this discussion that is, says that nuance is important. I am saying that on my podcast, with all the successful women I wanted to get and wanted to give a voice and had them agreed, they were the most flaky. That is what I'm saying. And that's my experience. And that is a fact. And I'm not, I, I haven't mentioned half of them. And it might even be the first time I've even said their name. And they fucked us about. And you, know, you have to go places and pay for hotels and all this kind of stuff. And I've, I've, so I, I, I went inside and I went, is it me? You know, have I got some projection of too much maleness? Or, and, you know, of course, many women accused me of that. But Did they? What did they say? Well, yeah, it's you, Rob. But did they say because you're too... I th I, Manly to what well, did you, you say? What's the you word? tell me because right. I can tell you this, mm. and I'll say this now. I don't think I've ever said anything that's in the remotest bit mis misogynistic ever online. Just because Andrew Tate says it doesn't mean I think it, and, and and I never have. And you can go back and you can see what's what's on the internet. And I went inside and thought, is there something about me that's repelling them? And I really worked on it. And we, do you know what we even did? 
we even started using my PA, who's a female, internally, to communicate with them, to wondering if we were being a bit aggressive or pushy. And we could not get round it. And now we're at the stage where we had all these great women. They cancelled us one, two, three and four times. I mean, Hilary DeVay, four or five times. And in the last one or two times, she was ill. And, you know, I, I rest in peace. You know, there's no judgment for me on here. But if it had been my way, there'd be like there'd be 35 percent women at least. And in the end, do you know what my MD, who's a woman, said? She says, maybe it's not your demographic. Maybe you should just stop trying to get women on the show and putting all this effort when you can't. Mm. And, then, and then women would say, oh, but oh, come on. But they're, they're not known or they haven't got a brand. And, you know, and I'm at the stage where I can attract those people. So I tried. Now, you can always try harder. But then we've got Peterson, who's very male. And then we've got Andrew Tate, who's very male. And we've got Katie Hopkins, who's a very male female. And so now when people go on, I can understand that it's like whoa, this is like male. Mm. And I'll, if there's anyone listening who knows anyone who's a very successful female um, and, and is of the, the right calibre, I will have them on my show in an instant. And, uh, you know, I'll have whatever conversations we need to have. I'm not scared to go to those places, as you can, you can see here. Mm. I'd love to do it. But if I'm taking full responsibility, we haven't nailed that. But I'm also, you know, sometimes people say to me things like, well, you know, but they've got kids and, you know, and I'm just thinking, well, these women are really successful in business. I imagine that they, they, their word is important to them and they've been, they've become wildly successful as a woman by probably having to deal with kids and stuff. I cannot give an excuse as to why nearly all the people that mess us around three or four times Apart have from the fact been that they're female. Women. Yeah, I couldn't find any mm. other. And now you're right. Now I'm at the I mean, my listenership is 85% male. Yours might be 85% female. I don't know. And we've almost manifested that because in the end, you're like, how many. Like, I'd love to have Sarah Blakely on the show. Mm. You, you know, and, and by the way, I've, I've had 20 equivalent males of her, mm. 20 male billionaires. Mm. And not, we, do you know we've gone for every female billionaire? Every single one. We've got none. So I'm here opening my soul on the anatomy of a leader saying, bring it. But I, I, I think there's something in successful women that they're holding back. What I do you do. think that is? I don't know. I'd love to talk about it, but I've got to get them on my show to talk to them about it. And now they go on my YouTube and they see Jordan Peterson, Andrew Tate, David Icke. I don't think you're a misogynist, but I feel that I'm not going to say like side, you know, siding with him, but I think the fact that you are supporting him by having him on your show well, and by not because in, in the beginning of your podcast with him you said that you're going to challenge him and the, I scrolled down and said you know are you a misogynist and you asked that once but you didn't probe him further on that like you didn't you didn't go deeper in well, that round round two well we I don't will. know if I'm gonna fair enough the vibe yep, watching fair that, enough. No, l let me look um I don't think he that I can remember blurted any or much misogyny on my episode compared to all the stuff he'd done in the past if there's anything specific you yes. want to ask me mm. i will state whether i think that's misogynistic I mean, one of the or not that he talks about is like the gen well, i don't know exactly if this is word for word but gender pay gap does not exist because women choose not to go for higher paying jobs that's what he said yeah i don't think that's misogynistic why not um i think it's a generalization mm. Because I, I think if you look at the if you look at the modeling industry, my guess on I, I've got oh. in fact, my guess is women get paid more than okay. men. Yeah. That's my guess. I had this discussion with I I, I want to have this discussion. Okay. I had this with my wife. We had a really mm -hmm. good discussion. We she came from the gender equality. I came from a different perspective, and I think we met in the middle. Let me tell you why I think about this. I believe in value equality. So if you bring more value than me, you should be paid more than me. I don't care what your gender is. If I bring but more value, value than you... value is not an absolute. 
No, it's, it's perceived by the market that you're in. Yes, and the market, the, the perception of the market is based on what society believes to be valuable at that time. That is a market. And if a society is patriarchal or has more men seated in the leadership yeah, I mean, positions, it, that is yeah, going to yeah. dictate yes. what is valuable. Yes, it, A woman ta- it, it staying evolves. at home and taking care of the kids is less valuable than a man going out to earn a living. Well, not necessarily, well, because that man might... Sp- Give half, you know, spend but, half of his money on his wife. Yes, but that's not always the case. No, it's not, but, but, it, but it is often. It's it, much it more rare often, in reverse. But it's not that rare for it to not be the case. The, the thing, the thing so I think with... The, thing the I think value with, argument, in my opinion, like, oh, well, you know, male footballers should be paid more because there's more of a market and female footballers should be paid less because, well, no women which watches them. Well, it's not been the right thing for women to watch sports. Why? It's not the women that decided that necessarily. I don't believe yeah, that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think And that... the same thing for models being paid more because, well, you know, they're female and the male models get paid less. Well, the market has been created by yes. men. Yes, It's been created but, by but, men. Yeah, but but so I, I, I don't really include myself in this because, remember, I believe value mm. and I don't care what the sex is. And I, I uh, by the way, I practice what I preach and I hire more men than women. And there's reasons for that because they have fundamentally different set of skills to men. And as a recruiter, I'm sure you would know this, which I think are valuable in build, building a company. Um, the, the football discussion is a good one because um, I don't think the, um, the captain of England or Spain currently should be paid as much as Lionel Messi. But I think that women's football is doing a great job of showing us what value it has. I mean, the, the British team are probably a bit more entertaining than the men's team. They went, got to the final, and things are changing. And so in that regard, there is progress. Progress maybe we've not had in society for a long time. And there's a lot more, as you say, patriarchal, matriarchal influence. I don't care about whether it's a man or a woman. I care who's bringing value and is that value useful to society. But here's the problem. I'm not the judge of that. If, if I own society, there would be no gambling. But then it would probably be done illegally, wouldn't it? It wouldn't necessarily... But like, that's my, my judgment. In my company, you get paid the most if you offer the most value. And most many of our senior... Um, People are women, and we're very supportive of their matriarchal needs that that men don't have. So uh, it doesn't trigger me um, because I also acknowledge I'm not a woman and I've not had the same suppression as a woman, maybe, but I can't, it's not a crime to be a 44 year old white male either, which a lot of people, you know, think that I am Satan because I'm a 44 year old white male. I, I, I wasn't given anything. I employ a, a lot of women I try and be fair I try and think about equality but I, I have my own vantage point I acknowledge to you if I was the mother of a 15 year old girl I might perceive Andrew Tate in a different way because I have my own lens I have never said anything misogynistic I don't think talking about the gender pay gap is misogynistic I actually think it's is it not good for people who want there to be less of a gender pay gap than someone like Andrew Tate is chirping Yeah, it's good, but not when you're denying its existence. Yeah, but the thing is, you're always going to have two sides of an argument, aren't you? And surely you want people wading in. Because him wading in, whether you agree or not, all of a sudden, 20 million people are discussing it that weren't before. Is that not good? No, I don't think it's good. Well, would you rather not talk about it and suppress no, it for rather, another 100 years? No, I would rather, if it's in an interview situation, when he's saying that gender pay gap doesn't exist, and at the same time he says, well, people don't research and don't go deep into the subject and don't look at all of the facts. Well, he hasn't gone into the facts. So you, as an interviewer, have a duty to push him on that and maybe, you know, try to get the other side of the story. And that's my opinion about that. Yeah, them. of course. And I, I, the thing is, you would interview him very differently to me. You would have a very... I wouldn't you, interview him. Well, no. Let's hypothetically mm. say you would interview him. You would interview him very differently with a very different set of questions based on your own beliefs and personal experiences. I'm always open to be asked to ask Andrew a question. And if there's anything anyone thinks I'm missing in my interview questions... Send them, put them on the YouTube videos, ask me to ask them. I, I often do. And as you know, it's not always easy to come up with really good questions. No. So I'm, look, I'm an open book and, and, and I'll take any suggestions. In fact, if I've got a load of questions pouring, that's half the work done for my, for my next interview. So I'd be very grateful. I, I think 
ultimately, I'm aware of my own biases, and they are what I am. But, um, you know, I'm not raising my daughter. I've never said anything misogynistic. Uh, uh, no one would ever say I'm misogynistic to, towards my wife. I mean, I always speak very highly of my wife. Um, and I would be quite happy to interview far more women. And I would quite be, be quite, I'd be quite happy to interview Andrew Tate and then interview someone who's completely against Andrew Tate and throw you know the other side. who you should interview, who you should have on the show, is I think his name is Richard Reeve. He's written a book on boys, on, only boys and men. I think he's based out in the US, but I think he's British. Do you know him, Harry? Richard Reeve? Okay. Should take a look at his book because he believes that gender equality is all about looking at the other side, which is looking at the young men in our society and redefining or creating the f version of masculinity that is relevant for our society today. Mm. So I think he would have a lot to say about well, that. One thing I will say about that, because recently people have been asking me about masculinity and I don't really talk about it too much. Like my wheelhouse is business and money and now people are asking me about gender identity and misogyny and masculinity and, and it's like, hmm. What I will say is this... It, I acknowledge it's quite confusing to be a young male right now. And, uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of lost young men out there. I think, I mean, when I went through puberty, it was f fucking confusing. Imagine now being a child. I mean, you've got children and when yeah. they get to teens with all these 60 or different gender identities and everything else, I'm not saying any of them are wrong. I mean, in my opinion, there's two main sexes. But I accept an unlimited number of gender identities if you want to identify. But if my child comes back and wants to identify as a cat, I've got a problem. And I'm like, fuck, what do I do here? And so, yeah, society is not like it was when I was young. And it, it changes. And I've got to dance and evolve with it. And there was no one like Andrew Tate, you know, back when I was. And the paradox of Andrew Tate, like, I don't know if I said about dual use paradox earlier, but everything has an upside and a downside. Andrew Tate has bought me a massive following and got me connected with some really good people and he's bought me a lot of heat. And, and I, I'm okay with going to those places. And I'm okay, if there's a, an opposite version, I'm okay with interviewing them too. But, you know, I, I, I hope that people will see that I am me and I am my own person. And, you know, like, my beliefs and opinions are mine. I don't believe what ever, everything Katie Hopkins says or J Jordan Peterson says or David Icke says. By the way, I've interviewed loads of really cool people which are not controversial, but we're not talking about them, which no. is a shame. No, but we're not talking about Andrew Tate because of him. For me, I would rather not see his face ever again or talk about it. The reason being is, first of all, but you're on my show and you have interviewed him. And mm. two, some of the things he says, I think, are damaging both to women but also to men. And that behaviour and supporting that, in my opinion, isn't right. Mm. Um, and so it's just trying to understand your perspective on it. Because you are right, there are very young, young vulnerable men who are lost, who don't know how to be. And just because you say that you work out, you're rich, and you work hard, or you say you do all of those things, that doesn't automatically give you a free pass to say are the terrible things because no. all of those things combined mean that everything all the good that you have done is kind of like wiped away from you if he were to come up and say i acknowledge what i said is wrong or i acknowledge that this has hurt somebody and you know this is what i'm doing to correct it to educate myself okay maybe Mm. But that hasn't happened and he hasn't apologised and he hasn't said anything about it to take away the damage that I believe he is doing to both women and to men. So, yeah, that's my opinion. Yeah, and I um, accept that and respect that. Um, and I think that the evolution of Andrew Tate and what happens in his case and beyond it and afterwards... It's going to be interesting to see. Mm. Um, you know, I see a lot of people in his community who th they essentially want to be him, but that's because they don't know who they are. Mm. Um, and I am me, and I don't smoke cigars, and I don't go and bash people up, and, and you know, all this stuff. 
the, the, the young impressionable men are looking to find who they are and then because they don't have the father figure that they or want the it to be father figure. or they have the wrong father figure I mean it's possibly just yeah that's just as bad isn't it then they're going to look for these other role models which I think now we're probably saying something similar and you know so this yeah I like I hope I mean he'd say that he does but I'll just say this to him if you know if this gets to him but I hope he really does think about his influence and the impact he's having because he can see his positive impact can he see his negative impact and is there a way he can could continue to have the positive impact and maybe lessen the negative impact that that's a, something I that think, you could ask yourself I think anybody who has created so much damage and has been basically cancelled if they come back and they are you know what I'm a changed man and I'm going to prove it to you I'm going to show it to you I feel that will do a lot of good for society because then you can see that transformation and what is possible that it is possible to create change it yeah. is possible to create even more of a positive influence if they had been one to start with mm. so yes I think it is I, mean, I think everybody deserves a second chance mm. and again I don't know the positive sides of what he's preaching. And yes, that is also, you know, a choice that I'm making that I don't want to go to because it's very, very triggering for me. And going back, you know, I was, I was thinking about this when you said, you know, what the misconceptions you had about me. And there was something about your voice, Gary's Vanachuk's voice and Jordan Peterson's voice um, and Andrew Tate's voice. And it's like, there are, please bear with me, there are some similarities because... Which are? Which are this elevate it you can call it passionate you can call it um it's it's very emotionally triggering and i was thinking why does okay jordan Peterson did kind of have that effect on me but then when i listen to what he's saying and also the fact that he cries a lot when he gets very emotional to me i'm like okay this person is using a range of his emotions he is comfortable with a different range of emotions to get his message across and his message is overall extremely positive i believe to young men with um andrew tate when i hear his voice it makes me angry it makes me so angry and i'm like what is this and one thing i've realized about myself is like when i feel angry most of the time, it's either injustice towards somebody else or injustice towards me. But the underlying emotion under the anger is fear. So I, it's like first it's anger and then it's fear. Fear for what will happen to the young boys, fear what might happen to young girls, and then also fear like, oh my, if I were to meet this person face to face, like I would be scared of him. As a woman, I would be scared of him. And when he's saying those things about it makes me think, well, I don't want more men to be raised in this kind of an image. Um, and it's interesting that you get asked about masculinity and I don't want to go down sort of, you know, different genders, but you did say something about, well, you know, maybe I'm kind of like too manly. So there is something on your mind about that. So what is your version of the best of what a man can be? So... Uh, since the whole masculinity thing has come out and toxic masculinity, I have taken some time to think about this. Now, my wife always tells me that I'm more of a man than these men, which makes me feel very loved. What do you and, think she means by that? Well, so I ask her, what are these things? Um, so this is what she says about me. Sorry if I embarrass her. Or, 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 you know, I think it's better coming from someone else than on me. But she believes that I'm an ambitious person. So that's a manly thing for her. To her, that Great. yeah, she believes that she's attracted to my ambition. When uh, she she recalls when we met, and apparently I went straight up to her to talk to talk to her, and she was actually one of the only the very few people I've ever gone up and chatted up. And apparently I had a business card, Rob Moore, property investor, and I gave it to her. And, and she afterwards thought, this guy isn't a property investor, but I like his chutzpah, mm. you, you know, sorry if I pronounced Big that bold. wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, she, and she, what she said she liked about me was my ambition. And because she met me when I was broke and, you know, I've, I've, I've built up a nice, well, we've built together, you know, a, a nice empire. And I've been the, the guy that's done the financial part. So ambition is one. And she thinks kindness and compassion actually really makes a man and she, she believes that I am that 
Um, she thinks someone who um, is in touch with their emotions but, you know, isn't sort of weak and flighty and a pushover. Um, so she, she would see that as a, a manly, manly quality. I mean, my wife's quite a practical person, so she doesn't say things like, you know, being sensitive or romantic because whenever I'm romantic with her, she's like, what do you want? Because she's, you know, she's just a practical... Like when you give money to yeah, someone, exactly. like, what do you want? Yeah, Why yeah. are you giving me all of this, right? Yeah. So compassion, kindness, ambition. I think um, she, knowing who you are and, and having a, a vision and clarity of self, I think she, she finds... So this is what she yeah. thinks of you. So what do you think are well, the Well, that's points? what she says are the masculine traits about me that she likes. Right. Obviously, there's the physical ones as well. I won't go into those. But that's her opinion. What's your opinion? Well, the reason I gave her opinion is because maybe it's more accurate or balanced. I, I, I think if you have to go on and on about you being a, mask, a man... Like, I asked someone, because apparently there's all these phrases like alpha male. And what was the other one, Harry? Sigma male. And I think, what is Sigma Man? Yeah, like okay. beyond Alpha. Oh, we see. Okay. Yeah. And like, I think... Well, alpha wasn't enough. Well, so this is it. And it, it, it this makes me squirm. Mm. And it, if anyone says they are an Alpha or a Sigma male, that, like you get triggered, I'm getting triggered. I'm not I'm actually like, triggered about it. I find it well, laughable. Well, we're all, we all well, get, I guess that's we all get triggered yeah. about different things, yeah. don't we? And we get triggered in different ways. Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm not going to let it ruin my life. Mm. But I'm just, I'm probably, I'm going to judge a bit. So talking about my own masculinity publicly makes me feel like a bit like I'm defining the, well, it's the not alpha. About your, it's not really about your masculinity. I think my question is more about what you believe defines a man, like a good man. That's the question. Okay, what defines a good man? Um, someone who has leadership qualities, who can take a problem or a situation and make a decision without a committee and go and make positive change now that can also be a woman can't it mm -hmm. but you know but that that's one character trait whether they're the leader of the family or the organization or whatever obviously there is the sexual and the testosterone and the energy you know, I find it confusing, and, and it's, it's quite normal, but I do find it confusing when I meet women who've got very masculine energies and men who've got very feminine energies. My, my wife actually has a theory on this. She thinks it's all the oestrogen in the water. Um, but um, I think so there's that's some... The, that, so, you, so that's the oestrogen making men... Less masculine, less masculine, yeah, because yeah, yeah, because so the, the, I mean, the okay. testosterone levels are way down, you know, mm. on average. So there is that. I mean, if I had no testosterone, uh, I wouldn't have the get up and go. I wouldn't do the challenges. You know, I do challenges all the time. I did a charity boxing match. I'm doing a challenge right now. I break world records. I do all those things. And I'm not saying that's not a, a female thing. So what I don't want people to hear when I say this is what masculine is, I want people are going to judge and go, oh, well, if women could be that too. I'm mm -hmm. trying to answer your question and without caveating myself. So strong leadership, decisive qualities and, you know, testosterone and the male energy. Um, what is that? It's what comes from testosterone. It's what comes from biologically being a male, which I mean, is which is why when you have a transgender, a, there's but that could be issues. aggression, right? Because that's what testosterone provides. Well, if it if it manifests in well, if it manifests in aggression mm. and competitiveness, which you would deem as more masculine qualities, then it is there. Yeah, and I don't think we can deny it. I think a good man controls those. I think what a good man does is they can be powerful and dangerous and damaging to protect, but they never use it. They choose not well, to. Well, this is what Jordan Peterson's main point is. We talk, it's about restraint. Mm, I, it's, I, it's, I do agree with that. It's about, like, I try and be polite with everyone. Um, I'm not a bully. But, you know, I have started to... I used to do a lot of self-defence and martial arts. Um, and, you know, I did a charity boxing match and I do um, other martial arts now. But you'll never, you'll never see me start a fight. You will never see me start a fight. Um, did you do before? I've never started a fight. Mm -hmm. Never. I'm a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> but I think I do now see it because don't forget, if we were in World War II, I probably would have had to learn how to shoot a gun and I probably would have been out there protecting 
you know, our country and my children and, and, and my wife. And I'm fortunate enough not to have had to be in that situation. But I think the world is changing now, Ben. It feels a bit more like, shit, could be close to World War Three and all this. So I'm, I'm, society is making me think, you know, maybe I should be able to protect myself and my family. And that is a more masculine thing than a feminine thing because naturally men are stronger than women. Um, and there are some people that say that women shouldn't learn how to fight. They should learn how to use their other skills. Um, because I, I, most people don't want to agree that men and women are different. They want to say mm. equality. But I prefer equity to equality. And men and women are different. Mm. And if we're going to make progress, we have to acknowledge that. This is why getting men to change their gender and being in female sports is fucking wrong. It is wrong. Like, my wife says this, and again, she might tell me off, but she reckons that most men who change their gender are perverts. And she doesn't think it women changing to men. And by the way, I've interviewed Caitlyn Jenner. I acknowledge there are some humans who, it must be so confusing to be them. But I think there are many men who are... You know, you, you can't allow this. Mm. You know, there was the man that got in the female prison and started going, going mad. How the, why the fuck did they allow that? How can you let a, an ex-man compete in a woman's sport? So what I'm saying is men and women are different. And we shouldn't allow men to go and compete in women's arenas. Um, but that is a highly charged subject. Yes. I mean, do you think a, a man who's making out that they're a woman, should be able to go into a female changing rooms? I am conflicted in that. I don't have the right answer to that or an opinion strong enough because I do believe that there are people who, whether they believe it or whether it is a biological reason that they feel that they're not in their mm. right gender. And I think there is a subgroup of people who feel and are uh, not accepted by society and when a society groups people in male and female you have a problem where do they go to the bathroom so there has to be some sort of and going into a male bathroom is going to be dangerous for them so I believe that that we don't we as a society haven't got the right solution and the only way we can say is like you go to the female bathroom so is there a third bathroom but that, that's, the, that's the right of one person putting the, the many at risk well, no, but surely one life is also important that we shouldn't put them at risk by them going potentially into a male bathroom and being beaten up. Mm, yeah, I mean, we, again, we're getting into the nuance to where it's probably based on an individual. I mean, I don't um, think we can look at it as a, you know, just the statistics because no, but the how nuance do you nuance? in the individual situation dictate also yes. how the rest behaves. And so I don't have an answer to that. I do believe that if it's a transgender man should not go into female sports. Yeah, I, I do completely believe that. Agree. Because I mean, how, do, how did that even happen? Having the advantage of having testosterone in your body you gives you an advantage over Strength a female hormones. So that is not a category that they can compete in. If Agreed. they go into men's sports, you know, is there a it's a public thing. Is it, It's different to going to a private space, which is a bathroom where you could potentially be in danger. Mm. I think those two things are very different. Yeah, I, yeah, they are different. And the sports one is easy for me, which yeah. it sounds like it is for you. It, um, it, it is for me because it's, an it's a physical advantage. And the reason why we separate men and women is because men do because have... Because men and women are different. They are and it's different. Okay. <gasps> I just said men and women are different. They are. It's okay. We should not judge a woman by a man's standards and we should not judge a man by a woman's standards. But we are judging well, women that's the by, problem, then. By, by That's male the standards. problem then. It is. It is. Yeah. And, uh, what do know, you think about feminism? Oh. Ow. Um, define feminism. The belief that men and women deserve equality or, as you called it, equity. I'm going to use those words interchangeably. I don't believe that men and women should have equality because we are different. I believe we should have equity where our differences are honoured and then individually those skills and traits that we have are very different are maximized and i would use an analogy of the school system so if you ask me what i think about the school system i think it's pretty shit mm -hmm. and i think we're taught a load of general shit we don't need and then when the geniuses 
pops up in all of us because we're all a genius in some way. In man- most mainstream schools, it, it, it doesn't get noticed. What I would say in school is, you know, we need to learn maths and English and things like that. But then let's find a way that we can bring out the individual genius. And then when we find the individual genius, let's get rid of all the friction and let's let them go for it. And let's let them become themselves. And let's not judge them. Mm-hmm. On, because, you know, you've got people who apparently got learning difficulties, but they're fucking great at selling, you know, the selling on, like, mo- most entrepreneurs are dyslexic, you know, you know for example. Is that a fact? Yeah, well, a lot, no. I, no. A lot of entrepreneurs I know, famously people like Richard Branson, my mm. friend Neville Wright, are hideously dyslexic. If you're shit in the classroom, you're probably good on the playground. Mm. You know, you've got good... I actually like, what, so the, the, I watched a little bit of the Jordan Peterson interview that you did with him, and I think he brilliantly put people in terms of his five personality traits yes. and entrepreneurs and that kind of like artistic, creative. Mm. And, you know, when you're dyslexic, you can't rely on your conscientiousness Man. or you know ability to be good with detail yeah, you, you've, you've got so to find out who you are mm. and then unleash that genius and school is a bit homogenized and mm. you know blanket and, and broad and in a way society is is a bit like that it's not really well, it's honoring trying to put people into very small categories that's what i believe so the category of you're a masculine man that means that's good you're a feminine woman that means that's good and everything else in between is kind of like yeah. well we don't understand it we're afraid of it but like money like we don't understand it we no. kind of afraid we don't want to talk about it and the same you know relating to the education system where we try to fix Fit everybody into the same mold sit at a classroom desk you know mm. parrot fashion learn and don't move and like that mm. is not you know adhd is on the rise well why because these people need to have physical activity like to be honest we all do mm. and so creating these very narrow view of what we're supposed to be doing in my opinion is what's creating the whole problem in the first place but um so would you consider yourself a feminist I would consider myself... I've never really... I don't like labels. I don't like labelling myself. Um, because I, I like the fluidity and the freedom of... Because I think it's a real strength to be able to change your opinion. And I think it's a real strength to be able to have discourse in a respectful way, even if you don't agree. And hopefully, you'll feel that that's how this discussion has been... in. You can tell me at the end. So as soon as I label myself, I brand myself something, and then I don't have that fluidity. So I've never really thought about labelling myself. If I, if I were to start putting some labels on myself, I'll, because you're the first person that's asked, I'm a valuist. What is that? I don't know. I've just made it up. <laughs> okay. Well, what it, so, okay, are you, I are believe, you just picking something out of the air? No. Or does it mean something No, I'm giving you, you a, an exclusive scoop. Oh, my God, you're a valuist. What well, is it? How do we join? Because... I, I, I believe we all have latent value. You're smart in areas I'm not. I've read and researched in areas you haven't. Our gentlemen here the same. And I believe if we could honour everyone's individuality, which is not easy because we have to put them in boxes, male, female, you know, left, right, because that's easy. Um, but if we were able to somehow... Give people the fundamentals that they need and the foundation to find their own value and uniqueness and strengths. And then society rewarded that because it often doesn't. And then you found how to be the most valuable human you can as a drummer or as an artist or as a podcaster. I, that's what I am. And that's why I probably might like capitalism. I mean, we don't, we're not really in a capitalist society. It's some hodgepodge. But I'd rather have that over communism because at least capitalism creates the free markets and the fair competition. It's not perfect. So I'm more of a valueist. I'm, I'm, I like enterprise. I mean, I call myself an entrepreneur. That's just because I love business and I'm passionate about business. But I'm, I'm probably more about free enterprise. Hey, what are you good at? Good, go do it. Let's get the government out of the way. Let's give you as much support as we can. Make sure, let's make sure you're being valuable, though. So we've got some rules. And let's make sure there's some competition down the road. So you're not greedy and, and, and let's play and let's see what, um, you know, how we can, you can make your greatest impact. Because so if you imagine the collective society is going to be so much better if everyone's as useful as they can be. Mm. But the problem is society is this, this sort of like very stereotyped set of rules, which judges everyone. Because when you're judged, you can't be yourself. 
if society, you well, know, you're this and you're that, and you've got to go over there, and you've got to be in the kitchen, and you've got to do this. And, uh, uh, no, we're all we're all different. So yeah, I, I'm a valuist, whatever that is. <laughs> okay, no, I'm with you in terms of putting people in just two small categories, and society wanting to push you into that because it's the brain needs to evolve. The human brain needs to evolve to be able to account for the different the nuance and the different ways of being. Mm. And I think that's definitely holding us back, both, you know, when it comes to like masculinity, femininity, entrepreneur, corporate worker, mm. you know, all these these labels that you well, kind of get Well, these change as well. This is what's hard. How old are you? 41. Okay, so I'm 44. They change. Like you're in recruitment. Matt, the, the workplace has, ch- since lockdown, I've never seen it change so much. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes, because the thing with money is it loves speed and it hates friction. So, you know, crypto is a far, fast form of money. You know, your Apple Pay is a fast form of money. So money's always looking for the fastest and the least amount of friction. And to a certain degree, that's how society evolves. Sometimes it de-evolves back, but often it evolves like that. And so as you're going through this rapid change, which gets faster and faster, you can get left behind. And it's really hard to keep up. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why I love being an entrepreneur is because I have to watch these things. And, you know, I'm talking about things on the podcast today that... Quite frankly, I didn't expect to be talking about. But that's how fast things change. You, you we started say talking you about yeah. to be grilled, so they well, go. <laughs> and you, you've you've gone for it. But but the point is, we started about money, which is my specialist subject, mm. and now we're talking about all these other manner of things, um, and, and and social media changes, and content changes, and business changes, and generally the people who are the the least stressed, who are able to find their value the most, who evolve the quickest, and who generally do the best in life as a person personal measure is those that can adapt to the change Mm -hmm. because there's nothing more frustrating when you feel you're stuck in another time zone i try not to be like that as a parent you know when my son goes through puberty i'm like you know yeah exactly (laughs) but i'm thinking about when i was but you know kids don't drink in the same way they don't socialize in the same way so I, i i I need to not be the guy that's stuck in the 1980s or, or 90s And being an entrepreneur really helps you with that. Mm. One of the things I really liked what you said in your book, Money, is... I can't remember how you phrased it, so bear with me. I think it was something to do with, like, let the money flow through you. Mm. And I really liked that idea. And that was, you know, when you gave me the £20, and I was like, oh, I can't take it. Because my personal belief around money is that I have to deserve it. But you could have gone and taken it to a nice boutique cake shop and given... £20 worth of cakes and then gone and given those cakes away. Yeah, I could yeah. have donated it to a charity of choice, mm. yes. But even though it's like, it's it's the block of saying, well, I still need to deserve it even if I am going to be giving it away. But I like this idea of mm. flow, of letting it flow through you and being more conscious about where do you actually put your money, mm. right? So you can spend it on... A Starbucks or you can go and spend it at your local coffee shop where Mm. you talk to the owner and you know their life and Mm. their kids and you've seen them all grow up. You can, you know, take this money, you can donate it to a charity, you can take this money and, I don't know, send it to your relatives if you're an immigrant somewhere else or you can buy some good hardware equipment for your podcast oh we do that <laughs> yeah 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 or, or it's never things. ending that is yeah. that is never ending yeah so no i really like that concept see for money to be able to flow through you now this i'm going to bring it back to your discussion about rich so the rich are very good at getting money flowing through them people assume greedy people they make millions and they hoard it they actually don't mm-hmm. you know they tip big they have a private crew on their private jet and a crew on their yachts and all those people are feeding their families so like money is a paradox dual use paradox everything has that which means that if you hoard money or i'm told to save i've got to save or this is mine no one will give you any more money to a point because you'll build that reputation conversely oh money's got to flow through me i'll just spend it on anything i want and it will come to me those extremes don't work so you have to be mindful of your money manage it well invest it well but some people who are hoarders have to spend more i'll give you an example of this and this is weird how this has happened but when i was 23 um, i was broke and she wasn't she had a good job and every time we went out she had to pay and it was humiliating for me and she was cool um and i said to myself like after we split up i was like i'm gonna make some money and i'm gonna Anyway, I did. I made some money and I took a few grand 
and I put it in an envelope and I stuck it through a door. And I basically said, thank you, but this is all the money you ever spent on me. Here it is back. Because I felt such shame. Now, that was just me. There's, that said a lot about my emotions around money. But what that did was that really got me to value going out for dinner because I couldn't afford it. And I would go and there would be, I would want to be with my girlfriend, but there'd also be some shame, some humiliation there. So I, I swore after that I will always get the bill. I will uh, and then, like you're gonna fight me, and let, you know to get this bill. You're one of those. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> okay. I, I was one of those before there was one of those. Mm-hmm. So I, I wouldn't fight anyone. I just go and pay it. It's always paid. I'm not. It's not not like hey, look at me. I'm paying. You mm-hmm. know, but I just always go and sort it out. Mm-hmm. It was a thing of mine. So notice how you judged me. I'm one of those. No, I'm one of me. Anyway, I've done that so much now that it's very hard for I'm me. I'm only to, doing it for clickbait. Of course, crack on. Okay, you're the first one. <laughs> <I'm> experimenting. <laughs> so. Now it's very difficult for me to get dinner because everyone knows what I'm like. And um, I've got one friend, Luke, who used to be in the UFC. He will, all keeps paying for my dinners the whole time. Do so we have to like prepay like a month in advance? Uh, no, just because he always takes the bill. Right. So here's my point. People pay for me now because for years I've paid for other people. Mm. So I believe the universe is giving me back what I've been giving it. And I, I could probably go out for dinner the next hundred times and not take my money and not say anything. I would never do that because you know why. And people would pay my dinner. So what I'm saying is the, the money flowing through you is not just, it's how you manage it and how you spend it and where you spend it and what you say to other people about what you do with money. And, and I think that's really important. Mm. But there's one thing you're talking about hoarder. If there isn't something coming in, it's very hard to then be like, okay, I'm just going to give the money out. Because it's also figuring out, well, I mean, income, right? Mm. And if you haven't figured that bit out, it's very hard to then, if you're that way inclined to be the saver, the scrimper, to then give the money away. I mean, look, you know, it, you either, you know, have lottery winners who are like, okay, great, lots of money, and then all of it is Can't gone. Can't manage it because, because they've got the is, money but not the skills. Well, they, they don't have the skills, but they also haven't figured out how to either make money, make money, mm. or create another business, or figure out some kind of a, a system where the money mm-hmm. comes in, yeah. which is what I like about the analogy of, of, of the flow, because it needs to come from one place and to go somewhere, as opposed to being only one directional, either yes. in or out. So one thing people don't understand about money, and I'm writing it, well, I've just finished writing it in my book, Money Matrix, which comes out next year, is that there are actually four stages, making it, managing it, maintaining it, and multiplying it. And in each one of those stages, different skills are required. If you want to multiply money, you've got to take risks. You've got to speculate. You've got to make big, bold moves. If you want to make money, we've got to figure out first, probably get out of debt first. Mm. So maybe, it, 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 let's, because what you've got to think about is what your base neutral is. If your base base neutral is you spend more than you earn, you've got to hoard a little bit more to change that. If you're the sort of person that's known as the tight-fisted, stingy one, you've got to do the opposite. So you've got to work out what your net honest base neutral is and work out, okay, it's either spending too much or not spending enough that's stopping the flow. Then correct those and make them more balanced. And as they become more balanced, so if you spend a little bit more when you're a hoarder, people will go, well, bloody hell, something wrong with Rob, he got dinner. I'll, I'll get the next one. And, and the world changes. Remember, all money comes through people. Mm-hmm. And then also, bloody hell, Rob's starting to save some money. He's not coming out drinking all the time and just spending all the money. And, and so stage one is getting out of debt and figuring out where you're out of balance and then getting back into balance. And then once you've got that sorted, you've got the right balance of in versus out, i.e. you've got a bit more in than out. And then when you want to work out, okay, how do I get more coming in? Because if you get more coming in, when it comes into something that's broken, it's broken. So more coming in might be starting a business, doing some um, calls, evenings and weekends, getting some extra commissions or stuff like that. Um, and then over a, once you've got a good system, then you can build multiple streams of income. So I have property and content and books and audio books and YouTube and other stuff. What are the qualities do you need to make money? Like um, top five. Okay. You need to be very useful 
to enough people. Valuist. A valuist, there you go. You need to be useful to enough people at something that they value. We were just talking about Charlotte Tilbury. Mm. A great example. Make, created monetization in many ways because obviously, you know, how people look is really important. If you're useful to one person, you're not going to make much money. If you're useful to 10 million people, whatever that utility is, you're going to make money. So, and, and to be able to be useful to enough people, you've got to figure out where you are useful, i.e., have you got a good idea? Have you got a good product? Have you got a good set of skills? So there's two. Then sales. You have to sell the thing. And there are so many coaches, consultants, trainers, and people out there who've got a nice product and they, they care. They're crap at selling. And they've got all these issues inside. They don't like rejection. They wouldn't want to be judged, you know, and all of that. See loads of artistic people like that. That used to be me. Do you have any tips on how to overcome that? Just know that selling is love. As long as what you do, there is love in what you do. I couldn't sell gambling to you because there's no love in gambling for me. But there's love in talking about money and creating content. And so if there's love in what I create, I can transmute that energy to you, not in a hippie, lovey kind of way, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Love in the terms of passion and energy. And, you know, I'd be pretty confident. Like, someone wanted to come on my podcast, Harry got it sorted out. And I'm like, they need to be a sponsor. And I did a deal with him and I got him as a sponsor. I said to Harry, You're damn right I'm closing him because what I've got is valuable. And, you know, when it comes to money, I'm, I'm a good seller. Um, you know, I've, yeah. I've got my next book, Money Matrix, and I love it. I'm buying it. <laughs> and, you know, everyone, needs, everyone needs to buy yeah. it. So, because w when there's no selling, there's no love, i.e., if you're embarrassed about what you, if you, you know, you know people say, well, you know, you've got to like the product. Well, yeah, you have, of course, because if you don't, there's no love. So, love and energy and passion, that's the best way, because I don't really see selling as selling. I see it as a, an exchange of energy you know between us like um i'm easy to sell to if you had a mcqueen shirt you're not selling to me i'm buying from you so so then there's marketing so selling is turning making the transaction but marketing is finding the person so um i always wanted to get married in a tom ford suit i think tom ford is absolute uh, he is one if anyone's listening and they can get me tom ford <laughs> l like we are made i, I will be whatever uh, am i might even disown andrew tate to get tom <laughs> ford oh God, <laughs> i know the the wife of the creative director now i love she came on the podcast tom ford i love tom ford um, and do you know the way he talks about his ex-partner it's just with love Love Tom Ford. And I always just, I, I, I get, when I like someone, like Radiohead or Porcupine Tree or Tom Ford or McQueen or Cartier, or I am a, the biggest fan. So um, I wanted to get married in a Tom Ford suit and I got the James Bond one, the grey one, the three-piece one. And I went in there and like, I thought I was just going to get a suit jacket and a pair of trousers, shoes, Apparently you need a day shirt and an evening shirt. And I had the tie pin, which is a few hundred quid. The tie and then the dicky bow. And I came out with about... I went in thinking the suit back, suit back then. I got married quite a while ago. It was, what, four, five grand? And I, I spent 11 or 12 grand. He was a brilliant seller. Because he was passionate about Tom Ford. Me going into the shop and me knowing Tom Ford was marketing. So knowing the brand is marketing. Going in there and having that upsell, cross-sell, all-sell experience is sales. So if you combine those things I've just said together, I think I covered four, you're going to do very well in business. The, the fifth thing I would probably say is make sure you embrace the more modern medium media of finding clients. Podcasts, YouTube, TikTok, Threads, X, formerly known as Twitter. You know, all your clients are out on all your social media because everyone's on social media. So... It's a great way to put your art out to the world by just showcasing it on social media. I mean, you're on Spotify, YouTube, iTunes. Yeah. That works. You're going to want to be on, of course, you, why would you not want to be on them all? Yeah. You can be seen by more people. Mm. Rob, 
You're a fascinating person. <laughs> and so do you do you regret or are you glad? No, I'm very glad. On? But I, I, I did think that I would be glad to have you on the show because you're open, you're vulnerable, you're passionate, you are well read, you write. I mean, anybody who can write 20 books like is impresses me very much. And you have a lot of genuinely not only interesting but very valuable valuable things to bring to the world valuist you heard it here first and i've learned about money or and relearned some of the things about money i'm very glad that you came on the show so thank you very much thanks for inviting me into your home yes and can i have that money now yes there you go can i have it all no (laughs) but i like that you asked (laughs) if you take the 40 quid yeah and then you go and pay it forward yes that's what i'm planning to do with it yeah all right all right that's my fee Thank you. For being on the show. <laughs> and thanks for having yeah. me on and inviting me into your no, home. amazing to I think have we've you. got to go now to our, to our next one, but it's been yeah. a lot of fun. No, thank you. You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader podcast. I'm your host, Maria Vorostovsky. If you haven't already, please follow and subscribe this podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode.